All right. Good morning, hey, good going? evening, or good night, depending on wherever you are here on the world. <laughs> and good evening to you, I guess, Joby, right? Yeah, thanks, Alex. We're covering a bunch of time zones today. I think you're at seven ahead of me. So, uh, and then we're going all the way back to the West Coast. <laughs> I am indeed. How are you doing, Joey? Good, good. Busy, busy week, but uh, nice to talk about uh, database throughput and how to design uh, design for good throughput. Sounds like a fun topic that we're going to cover today. My last experience here on Learn TV was actually a few weeks ago, just prior to New Year's Eve, and I haven't seen you this this year. So happy New Year to you, I guess, Joey. <laughs> yeah, happy new year to you as well. Uh, 2022, here we are. 2022. Well, let's hope not 2022. <laughs> yeah, yes, that would be that would be bad. <laughs> that would be bad. Okay, uh, so for those of, of you who don't know us yet, you are going to know us, obviously. Uh, my name is Alex. I'm Microsoft MVP and also regional director, or more specifically, part of the regional director program and part of the MVP program. My Azure work, my work uh, category on MVP, and the MVP program is Azure. But I'm also super, super, super passionate on data, AI, IoT, embedded stuff, robotics, and whatnot. And here we have with us my my dear good friend Joey. Joey, do you mind introducing yourself? Yeah, hi guys. I'm and everyone. I'm Joey D'Antoni. I'm principal consultant at Demi Training Associates Consulting. Uh, I'm also a Microsoft MVP uh, for Data Platform, and I've been working with databases since I started working with computers. So for a long, longer than I care to admit now. <laughs> Let's not do that. Let's not do that. Yeah. And we also have with us our fun moderator, Chris Hyde, who is not on the screen, but who's here to help us. And actually, this goes out to everyone streaming in, either from YouTube, from Learn TV, from uh, Twitter or Twitch, wherever you are around the world. Let's just, make, let's just be interactive. If you have any questions, we'd be more than happy to take them. And Chris is going to do a fantastic job actually covering these as well. And it actually doesn't stop here. There's a large army of people working like super crazy to bring you this content and also to bring you all of this material. And we say hi to all of them and thank you so much for your support. Okay, Joey, what are we gonna cover today? So we're gonna cover, uh, I'm gonna cover planning resource requirements for Cosmos DB. It's, it's always a really hard question when you're building a new application. You know, what are the requirements gonna be for the database? I know I've been a DBA for a long time in various roles in my career. Uh, I've just gotten paid different levels for it, but, uh, Whenever I work with application developers that are building a new application, one of the questions we always ask is, you know, how many concurrent users are you going to have? And how much storage do you think you're going to need? And, and usually most developers answer, you know, we're going to have somewhere between 10 and 100,000 concurrent users, and we're going to need somewhere between 10 gigabytes and, you know, uh, 20 terabytes of storage, somewhere in, in there. Somewhere uh, in there, yeah. Yeah, and, and, in and it's really Euro hard. And to... infinity and beyond. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really hard to define that stuff. So we're going to talk about some methodologies uh, and some of the approaches that within the Cosmos DB world of infrastructure that you can choose to to go forward with for your for your application and how that's going to how that's going to scale. And I think you're going to be talking about uh, how to configure databases and containers there. I sure am. Absolutely. I'm actually one of those individuals who initially, unlike yourself became an accidental DBA, I might say. My, 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 my background is as a software developer, and inevitably you have to work with data, and obviously relational databases made a lot of sense. But when DocumentDB back in the day, and then later on Cosmos DB came around, um, I mostly as an enthusiast and as, as an Azure user, was very interested, I was very interested into it. And very similar to your story, actually, I have a lot of customers who I'm work with or who am I consulting? And they always have pretty much the same questions. How do we configure our database for this and for that? How do we configure our throughput? How do we configure our SQL APIs? And how do we configure the partition keys? By the way, our last episode on the Learn Live TV series around Cosmos DB was specifically on picking the right partition key and uh, how do you do denormalization and all of those fun things. So if you want to watch that after this live session, of course, or after this recording, if you're watching this recorded, then make sure to also head over to that episode of the series. And I'll, so, have, a little, I'll have a little bit of content on that to get you started too. So mm -hmm. you can go from there from there to the, to the show Alex is referring to. Absolutely. Sounds good. Shall we get started? Yeah, for sure. Let's do that. Oh, there's no oh, certification. Thing. Before we forget. <laughs> 
<laughs> Before we forget, there's also a certification that has been around for like, what, almost two months now? It's still in beta, as far as I know, at least. It's called the Azure Cosmos DB Developer Specialty. And if I were you, I would definitely be interested in actually taking this exam and obviously passing it as well. This exam is going to give you all the ins and outs. And as you prepare for this exam, you're going to take all the skills necessary to, well, prepare, configure, develop, monitor, assess, and optimize your Cosmos DB workload. Did you already take the exam, Joey? Uh I didn't take it. I, I kind of worked on it. And this is kind of evolved in, in building it. Uh, this is kind of evolved out of some of the data engineering stuff and some of the the other exams that Microsoft had that didn't really have the breadth to give us the deep focus into Cosmos DB. You might have gotten like 25% Cosmo DB questions before. Now it's, it's its own dedicated exam. So for those of you who are kind of specializing in this skill, uh, it's definitely something you want to add to your to your exam resume. I couldn't agree more. Good. But now it's really time to get started, right? <laughs> <laughs> so our learning objectives today are actually going to cover several aspects. First and foremost, we're going to talk about um, evaluating various requirements of your application. It's all about those scenarios in which you must think about your application, what your, what your requirements are, how many users you're going to have. Like Joey mentioned previously, the, the number of users is going to be something that's super variable. But there are some features and some optimizations that you can take uh, advantage of in Cosmos DB to actually meet your needs. So we're going to cover those. We're going to explain those. And then next, we're going to talk about comparing the various service and throughput offerings which are available in Cosmos DB. There might be a lot of confusion around these. What is auto-scaling, what is serverless, um, what is pre-provisioned throughput and stuff like that. And most importantly, what is an RU, right? Because we use this uh, analogy to the horsepower of a machine, but in Cosmos DB context, RUs. And we're going to elaborate a bit on that. It, it, um, it, it makes way more sense than the old Azure SQL database DTU for, what it's for whatever that's worth. <laughs> <laughs> totally, 100%. And then last but not least, we're going to talk about migrating between standard and auto-scaling throughput, which we have just mentioned. But also, I want to emphasize, and I really want to put pressure on, on, on this one as well, I don't want people to forget this is a live interactive session. Unlike other recorded sessions, this is really live right now. So please make sure to head over to chat, say hi, ask any questions you have, and you might actually uh, um, even have them or pop any questions as, as we go through the material. And we'll answer the questions as we go through. But even if we don't get your answers or your questions live, we have moderators from our team who are actually monitoring and who are also SME, subject matter experts on, on, on this. And they'll be more than happy to actually cover the material. Yeah. Cool. Cool. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Let's talk about planning resource requirements. Like Alex and I discussed, this has always been uh, kind of a challenge between DBA and developer. And one of the, to me, advantages of cloud computing platforms like Cosmos DB is we do have a lot of flexibility in being able to kind of scale resources relatively quickly uh, without, you know, if, if we needed to go from that, you know, say 10 gigabyte to that 100 terabytes, we have the ability to do that without going through, you know, a storage team that's going to take three months to requisition storage from a vendor that's going to take another month to deliver it, et cetera. It's very, elasticity is probably the main benefit of cloud computing. But let's face it, that elasticity comes at a cost. So we want to right size our resources. And we're going to talk about some ways you can do that. And one of the things, one of the ways we do that with Cosmos DB, and this is kind of my lecture on partition key, because partitioning really does drive uh, a, a lot of the way we properly configure our, our Cosmos DB and how we're querying resources efficiently. So we want to we want to query our resources efficiently. So we use partitioning to scale individual containers in a database to meet the performance needs of your application. In partitioning, items in a container are divided into distinct subsets called logical partitions, and they're formed based on the value of something that's known as a partition key. If you've ever worked with a data warehouse, uh, this is a pretty common structure. Uh, and all items in the logical partition have the same par partition key value. If you've worked with data warehouses, you know you might partition by date. In a Cosmos DB, you might be partitioning by user ID or customer ID. So for example, a container holds items. Each item might have a, a unique value for a customer ID property. Um, the customer ID property is going to serve as the partition key for, for the items in that container. 
and there are a thousand uh, unique ID user values or customer ID values, a thousand logical partitions are created. So we have one, one partition per key. And we have two key components of that. Uh, sorry, bad pun. Uh, we have two components of the partition key, the path and the key value. So an item, example, customer ID, one, two, three, four, vendor name, Microsoft. Uh, if we choose user ID there as the partition key, there are two, uh, two partition key components. Uh, so we can either go with customer ID or, or works for and, and split that either way. So depending on what we do, uh, we want to make sure we're, we're designing our partition keys appropriately. And there are a couple of things that are important there. Your partition key should not change. So if your property is a partition key, you can update that property's values and it should have high val high cardinality. So it should have a wide range of possible values. Uh, so that's kind of like your database design lesson for the day. Uh, but from there, we can talk about Cosmos DB and evaluating the various requirements of your application. There, there are a couple of things I want to take away from, from uh, your intro here, which I think is brilliant, Joey. The first one is elasticity, and I really want to put a bit of emphasis because the entire nature of the cloud is to be elastic, right? So if you just take something from back in the day that we would have run on premises and then run it in the cloud and expect that to be elastic, well, you, you might have your bets wrong, if you ask me. Mm -hmm. And Cosmos DB has been designed from the ground up to be elastic in that sense, where you might have a lot of customers, for example, during Black Friday, and then your workload requirements actually fail, right? Or fail, full rather than fail. Uh, which means that by the nature of Cosmos DB being elastic, you don't need to pre-provision all that throughput, right? Put differently, when you evaluate your requirements, because this is what we're talking about right now, even in context of partition keys and whatnot, when you evaluate your requirements, you don't need to know beforehand, a year in advance, how many customers are you going to actually serve next Black Friday, for example. Mm -hmm. But instead, you can reconfigure those, those database workloads and reconfigure the RUs that we're going to uh, briefly talk about in a bit um, on the go. Effectively, right? And then going back to the partition key, I think one of the key takeaways, in my, if, you, if I may, is <laughs> you must think about your data structure and your data design in much more um, careful way as you would normally do in a relational database, I would say, because yeah. Where, where you would normally normalize, right, in a relational database, you would denormalize over here and have duplicates and triplicates and know so many copies of your data over and over and over again because you want to create these logical partitions which are actually an indication for Cosmos <clears throat> for Cosmos to be how, on how to create the physical partitions and once these logical partitions are set up you can very fast with a minimal RU consumption query your data insert your data and so on and so forth it's kind of similar to what you would do in a data warehouse right where you you denormalize the data for more efficient read operations that's kind of effectively what you're doing there uh, yeah and, and I think Key. A lot of times I see poor design in a relational database and you can kind of hack up, you can make a hack up for it, uh, but by using indexes to, to kind of overcome some of the, the poor patterns that we see implemented in databases, it's a lot harder. I mean, we, we can add indexes and, and do things like that, but our ideal design is based around this partition key model. And that's how you're going to build kind of the most cost effective scalable design. Now, with the risk of actually drifting away a bit from, from the content, Dave, but don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> I do want to touch on the partition key with an additional top, uh, with an additional question that we have got from our audience uh, on Twitch, specifically from uh, Fuel Snubble, and I probably mispronounced this. My apologies for that. Um, and maybe you, you want to take this one. So I'm going to read it out loud for you, Joey. Uh, can you use a, per a partition key to create indexes? So I have a user with an ID. Then I like to index the email address. So I create the new object with the email as a partition key, which then references the customer ID. Whew. <laughs> My concern there is that email could change because uh, it's a property of customer. And if you're not using that as effectively your primary key or customer ID, uh, you're not going to be, and you make that a partition key, then you're not going to be able to update that. Uh, one, I think also one important aspect um, in Cosmos DB is that by default, every single property of every single document that you're adding in your workloads, in your document uh, containers are indexed. Right, so right. It is always preferable to make sure that you're only indexing those properties that you're querying against. So if you think in 
uh, well, mathematical data set terms, if you have a filter with a predicate, that predicate is specifically is going to be used for the indexes that you're going to configure. So you disable that default indexing of everything and rather focus only on the indexes that you really need. And then you have composite, you can have also composite indexes and whatnot. Uh, but going back to the partition key versus um, indexing, in my opinion, the best approach here is keep your partition keys on the identifier if that's something that you would um, commonly query or retrieve your data based on. And then if you need to query or create a filter at some point based on the email address, just to give you a mention, Joey, because that is something that might change at some point in time, mm -hmm. I would only use an index for that and not use a partition key for that. Yeah, the, I, I think unless you were using email address as customer key, which I, I, I don't, from a database design perspective, I, I don't love doing. I, I just think yeah. it's not, not the best approach. I agree. Uh, but of course, there are so many different scenarios. There might be a different answer actually for this one as well. Uh, but, but let's let's stay online. Let's take it offline if we need to, and let's just follow up. That one Everybody's well. favorite consultant answer. It depends. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. So I think we have nailed our introduction probably more than we should have, if you ask me. Uh, I think it's obviously that it's super, super important to put a lot, of that, a lot of emphasis on the planning stage where you're evaluating your requirements, at least the ones that you know, because we both know, Joey, like the <laughs> initial requirements and the actual requirements and features your application has six months later, they don't always match. <laughs> Well, especially for for new applications, you as you're you know you're building a web a web app or a mobile app for your company or something that's ga game gaming related. You honestly don't really know what that's gonna what that uptake is gonna look like. Yeah. Now, one of the most important things when it comes to evaluating application requirements is understanding what we refer to as throughput. Want to touch a bit on on that? Yeah. So. <laughs> Everything in throughput in Cosmos DB, you'll hear the term RU uh, a lot, uh, and it's which stands for request units. Uh, and a request unit is, like Alex mentioned, kind of the equivalent of horsepower. Uh, because gas is cheap where I live and I got a good deal, I drive a car that has approximately 440 horsepower. Ooh, I envy you. So, uh, yeah, what does that mean? I honestly don't know. I mainly drive the speed limit and I'm driving usually under, you know, 50 kilometers an hour most, most places I go. But my car gets to 50 kilometers an hour in a hurry. Uh, well, request units in, in, in Cosmos are just a performance concurrency that abstract system resources like CPU, IOPS, and memory. So one of the nice things about Cosmos DB is you don't have to think about you know, how much memory is allocated, how many cores, although cores come into play now uh, in, in some models. Uh, but uh, this RUs abstract system resources into uh, the single unit. And the, these are defined by the cost to do a, a point read. So like fetching a single item by its ID and its partition, partition key value uh, for a one kilobyte item is one request unit. All other so, database items, go ahead, Alex. So if you are to make a comparison maybe to the old days, as some would call, where you were setting up a SQL server or maybe even a SQL, National SQL database uh, instance based on uh, the vCore model, back in those days, you would have to understand how many CPU cores do you need, how much internal memory do you require, uh, maybe even more internal memory if you're using in-memory tables. Yeah. Um, you would have to set up, what, a bunch of different disks and file groups for your databases, maybe one for your logs and one for your data and one for your master files or e for temp for you and whatnot. Even now, I do that all the time for customers moving to Azure VMs running SQL Server. <laughs> and it, it's not that those terms are impossible to, to think of, but whatever decisions you make at the very initial phase of setting things up or creating the database, they're you're kind of stuck with them. You can't really change them afterwards. Yeah, Whereas in Cosmos DB, Everything is abstracting under, under a single number, which even more importantly, as we have mentioned previously, is elastic. So you can increase, decrease that based on your actual needs. Yeah, and depending on the nature of your application, you can add scale other ways too, because you can add read replicas uh, and you can even add read write replicas, which is something that's much harder to do on a relational database. Uh, yeah. And so all other, all other database operations are assigned a cost using request units. No matter which API you use, we're specifically talking about the SQL API here. Uh, but the other APIs are all managed, uh, whether it's graph or table or column family, uh, those are all measured using RUs. Uh, so whether it's a write, point read, or a query, same thing, always, always measured in request units. And uh, this, 
The other thing to note is our hierarchy of resources. So a Cosmos DB is a unit of management uh, for schema agnostic containers. Uh, mm -hmm. Each container is a unit of scalability for both throughput and storage. And we're going to talk about how you can do container level provisioning, or you can have container and database level provisioning here in the next couple of slides. And that's kind of <laughs> let's awesome. maybe talk about the container level uh, provisioning. Yeah. So any throughput that you provision for a container uh, is reserved specifically for that container. Uh, and that throughput is available only for that container all the time. And, and this is backed by your SLA. Uh, but what you, the, that container is going to receive that full throughput. Uh, and you might do this, uh, for example, uh, I'll give you an example if you had, if we were using customer ID, and your largest customer was the customer we the, the the container in the middle here. So we had maybe you know a million records for that customer, and we had right. ten thousand uh, for each of the other two. We'd obviously want to assign more resources to the customer uh, with the busiest container. Alex, right. you had an example that you wanted to share. Yeah, actually, I have a question and an example here. Uh, I think your example with having a multi-tenant system, like your own application, which is serving multiple customers at once, where one customer has a million whatever end users or entities they want to store doc documents, and then you have another one only storing 1,000 uh, documents. It's a fantastic one. But actually, my follow-up question to that one is, how, how do you use the containers? Uh, I, I see a lot of customers misinterpreting the concept of a container, especially if they come from relational databases. Sometimes they think a container should be a table, right? With, mm -hmm. Without actually realizing that you can have documents which have uh, shifting or different schemas all within the same container. Um, sometimes they think that the container sh is only a uh, mechanism for configuring the container level throughput and then the same table that you would have had in the relational databases or data set effectively should be split into multiple containers. And the answer, again, typical consensual answer is it depends. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> it doesn't really matter. Your container can be a single uh, data structures, data, data format, data schema, but it can also contain multiple data structures. And we hear by, by, by this, effectively, we go back to the conversation around partitioning, because that's what effectively defines um, how the actual split of your data physically happens. Now, obviously, mm -hmm. when you configure a partition key, you don't instruct Microsoft and the Cosmos, the Cosmos DB service to split your data because you don't have access to the physical uh, partitions, but rather you instruct them through the logical partitions concept. And if your logical partitions are at some point large enough, then they obviously might become physical multiple physical partitions. And I also want to touch base a bit on this large enough. Joey, what is large enough in Cosmos DB? <sighs> I mean, Good let me put it differently. Would you use Cosmos DB for uh, supposedly an e-commerce uh, um, um, a flowers shop maybe, which has an e-commerce website selling 20 different products, maybe 100 orders per month? I'd probably use a relational database for that, uh, just because my throughput's not going to be high enough. That being said, I get a lot of flexibility about changing my order catalog. Uh, and I, I like that option. And there are ways we can provision Cosmos DB where our costs aren't going to be that high since we're not using it that much. Uh, so. To keep going back, to it depends. It depends if my flower <laughs> shop were, buy, were buying an off-the-shelf solution, which is probably the right answer for them. But if they there insisted on custom developing, uh, I think Cosmos DB gives them a lot of the flexibility and schema is really the benefit on the, on the lower end, right? Like you get, uh, and compared to some of the other document databases that historically and they're improving have been a little bit less flexible or just you know weird about doing updates and stuff. I think you get a lot of kind of interesting benefits in terms of the development experience for Cosmos. Um, and for the longest time, I think the the entry cost was kind of high relative to other low end data sources. But uh, we fix that a lot. We have serverless options. For, so for a small shop, it's possible. Uh, but it may not be something we necessarily want to take advantage of. But uh, Really, where you get to see the benefits are when you're at scale, right? And you're having a high throughput workload that demands low latency. We're definitely going to touch base on the serverless uh, workloads and scenarios in, in a bit. But if we are to go back to our conversation on container level throughput provisioning, if you think about containers and each container having their own pre provisioned throughput, I think this lends itself quite nicely when you have multiple customers split into different containers and all of their data, even though it's different types of data, like you have your person PR or your people 
uh, data set, and then you have your order data set, and then you have your product data set and whatnot, could be part of the same container on the assumption that these are small enough, uh, small enough data sets. Obviously, there's more takes to it, and there's many, many different scenarios which could lend themselves nicely to um, scenarios where a single application or a single customer has is using multiple containers. But then you have to think about your RU uh, allocation in terms of the actual utilization of that data within that customer, within that application is that. Um, following up with that, another throughput model that you can leverage is the database level throughput provisioning. Mm -hmm. Now, as the slide that you see here uh, suggests, now we're not defining the RU per container, but per database. Joey, when would you use this? So this concept's a little bit simpler. Uh, this is more like an Azure SQL database where uh, it, I was trying to, I always, and it's because of my background, I always try to make analogies to relational databases and what their structures look like, where the container level provisioning is kind of like if anybody's ever used, and this is a really kind of complex feature in SQL Server, but resource governor, where you just divide your, your workloads into resource groups. If you could somehow combine that with partitioning, that's effectively what you're getting with container level throughput. With database level throughput, you're saying all of my containers have access to the same pool of compute resources and, and storage resources, of course. Uh, and this means you should get predictable performance on, on e any container. Of course, one, you know, one set of queries or poor partitioning key could drive uh, drive a lot of work to a specific container and you could you could feel hot spots, but in general, you should expect to see consistent performance. Uh, because the containers share the same provision throughput, uh, there's no guarantee for throughput of any <laughs> container in a database. Uh, and the performance that a, a specific container is going to receive is going to be dependent on the number of containers. Like I mentioned, the partition key that's chosen between those containers how the workloads distributed. So like, especially when you're dealing with distributed data systems, you always kind of want to be on the lookout for hotspots in the, and that's just the nature of your data as it can evolve over time. We keep going back to the customer ID example, but if you have one customer, let's say the average number of records your customers have is 10,000 and you have quote unquote, an average customer who went from 10,000 records to a million records in a month you may want to reevaluate how you're distributing that data uh, at that point because you may have skew and you may need to give that container more resources as opposed to having shared resources throughout the container. So this is bad analogy, but it's like having multiple customer databases on the same SQL server. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I think that's a very good analogy, actually, for that matter. Um, now, since we have container throughput provisioning and also database level throughput provisioning, there's one more. <laughs> There's so, so when that customer goes from 10,000 records to 10 million records, uh, you can split this. And, and I think this is really kind of where we, where we see a lot of advantage uh, in the cloud, right? Because we can, if we have that customer who grows suddenly, it's very easy. We, we don't have to like physically remove their, their stuff. We just provision their container. It's dedicated RU capacity. Uh, and we leave the, the other containers to, to share the shared capacity within the database. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic example, actually, for this one. And one thing that we didn't really touch a lot on is that this entire content, this entire module that we're covering right now on um, understanding throughput needs and evaluating your application requirements and whatnot is focusing on SQL API. But as you know, Cosmos DB actually leverages multiple APIs all around the concept of NoSQL. So there, mm -hmm. there's your document DB, which is NoSQL, or your document API specifically, right? Which is Mongo and the former document DB, well, SQL API. <laughs> then there's another API that you can leverage for graphs, which is your Gremlin API. There is your table API, that you, which you can leverage. And then you have uh, your columnar API as well, which is leveraged through the Cassandra implementation. They forget one. Cassandra, Table Storage, Mongo, Gremlin, SQL. I yeah. think that's it, right? Cool. Um, so with that being said, the reason why I'm mentioning this is that a lot of these concepts actually are applicable to whatever API you're using. The terminology, the terms that you're using, however, might be different. And on, on that, actually, we do have a question from Jose on YouTube. You want to take this one maybe, Joey? Yeah, the, the question is, when should we use the columnar database, uh, Cassandra API, or the document uh, database? 
slash MongoDB API. And, and I think uh, that may be where we, we didn't miss one, but there's two APIs for the, for the document database. You can use either Mongo or, uh, or, SQL. or the SQL, which is the old document DB uh, API uh, in Cosmos DB. Uh, so it really depends on the nature of your data uh, and kind of what you're comfortable with. So the nice thing about Cosmos DB is it's one data store and it gives you the flexibility to, to deal with that in the, the kind of physical and to an extent logical architecture is pretty much the same between all the APIs. Uh, so your performance is going to be somewhat similar, but it's it's going to be kind of the, the nature. Uh, Cassandra has its pretty strong use cases. Uh, I knew Netflix used it a lot for cataloging stuff. I It's been a while since I've touched Cassandra. Uh, that was several jobs ago. Uh, what are your thoughts on where you use document versus uh, column family? Um, whenever I need to run, well, I think my best analogy would be OLAP. Um, whenever I need to run like an aggregation on on something where you're not interested in actually querying the actual document itself, but maybe run an aggregate for um, determining a running total, like the sum of the old your orders, depending on on, on one object of, of sorts, um, that that's where I would use it. For example, cool. Okay, so I think we. Did a pretty good job, if I may. I'm pretty arrogant on that one, on actually explaining the, the various throughputs. Uh, but there's more to actually evaluate and understand your application requirements and your application needs, isn't it? You also need to understand your throughput requirements, which is somewhat different. So, yes, go, go ahead. ahead. <laughs> uh, request units are rate based. Uh, so they they are used, we use those to make uh, physical resources like memory and CPU uh, perform those requests. So it's easy to think of 10 request units as twice as much as five. Uh, in e but each request contains a fixed number of re request units. So this can be reads or writes, uh, or, or queries. Uh, and you can provision that request unit uh, in, in units per second. And this is going to be Kind of how much data we're, we're really pulling back and to me to me this is like the difference between uh the size of your <laughs> the size of your network pipe and the speed of your cpu i guess or the speed of your storage uh to kind of go into physical architecture terms where were you going with that no I, yeah i think that's a good this is an explanation i think it's also worth mentioning here that uh the minimum pre-provision throughput that you're configuring is going to be 400 RUs per second and each time you want to increase that, you're going to use increments of 100. Now, why is this important? Because uh, the actual billing model for Cosmos DB is based on the RUs that you have uh, not consumed, but you have provisioned. So you can obviously say, hey, my workload at some point in time might require 10,000 RUs. But then you're, because you have pre-provisioned 10,000 RUs for every single second, when you had 10,000 RUs provisioned, you're going to pay for that, right? Um, so again, going back to the nature of the cloud, you want to make sure that you're elastic in, sen in the sense where you're following your actual workload needs. So sure, it's a good idea to pre-provision more than you should, but it's also actually a good idea to follow your trends and your actual uh, application needs. Yeah, and I think this is going to lead into, especially when we talk about serverless, uh, especially early in the life of your application, uh, using auto, things like auto scaling can be really beneficial as long as you're monitoring it carefully. Uh, you, I think the number one, we do a lot of cloud architecture consulting and the number one thing our customers are scared of is unpredictability in their billing. And when you're, when you're building new services, it can be quite challenging to kind of understand what, uh, what the, the first bill is going to be. The second, the second and third bills are much easier, but the first bill can be a challenge. Uh, so when you're using an auto scaling solution like that, you can kind of very carefully monitor your consumption and then move to, to more of a provision model. But even though there is a variable rate, right, at, at the actual bill that you pay at the, at the end of the month, um, you, can, you can, however, estimate the actual mm -hmm. ad hoc RU consumption that you will require. Which means that even though it you might fear the fact that you don't know what you're going to pay at the end of the month, it's not very difficult to estimate and to forecast what your actual assumption or cost will be. Because when you think about 
estimating the ad hoc RU consumption, the thing is that some RUs are actually normalized across various access methods, making many different common operations predictable, therefore. So if you take this knowledge, you can actually perform some basic estimations for simple workloads. So for example, you could estimate the RUs required for um, a common database operation, such as one RU uh, for read and maybe six RUs for a write operation of a one kilobyte document in optimal conditions, of course. And if you have this knowledge and if you use this strategy, you should actually be able to identify your solutions query and access patterns to make an edu educated guess as to how many request units will be needed in um, Azure Cosmos DB. For sure. And, and being able to isolate what those top five queries are in every application, there's always, it, it's typically 90, 10, 80, 20, uh, you know, five, five or so queries that consume the vast majority of the system resources. Uh, so understanding what those are and understanding, you know, how you're doing that uh, can get you pretty far along and how you can estimate that consumption. Oh yeah, absolutely. And then you can obviously like use a spreadsheet application maybe to build a quick table to figure out the rough estimation of your uh, needed request unit capacity. So if you're, for example, writing a single document that you would need to create, say, 10,000 requests on, well, and one request consumes, say, 10 RUs, you will need, well, 100,000 RUs per second for that. And clearly, you can also think of this in terms of parallelism. So whether, uh, where rather than requiring 10,000 requests per second for a single document and write, you might as well yield uh, 1,000 requests per second for 10 different documents if they are part of the same partition, for example, and you would end up using the same 100,000 RUs per second for that as a total consumption. And similarly, if your top one query consumes, say, uh, 700 requests per second, and the number of RUs consumed per request is 100, then you will need a total of 7, uh, 70,000 RUs per second. Um, and you, you can take effectively this knowledge and get ready to estimate the overall total RU consumption for your, for your application. Obviously, one important aspect will be understanding the actual RU for one operation, because yeah. we are using these numbers right now, right, as, as good examples. But when you're developing your application and when you're, when you're requesting a JSON effectively from, Doc, from Cosmos DB, uh, you won't exactly know what the RU consumption is un until you do some metrics and performance monitoring and so on and so forth. Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely, a, it's, it's a very, like most databases, it's very instrumented uh, and, and further so that it's cloud. So you can, you can have the monitoring without having to do anything. So you can, you can kind of quickly go back in time and see what your uh, test workloads look like to get you a good idea of what that throughput is going to look like. Uh, of course, the, the thing you probably don't know until you, you, you expose this to customers is what that concurrency is going to look like. And that kind of drives our next topic a little bit. And that's our data storage, because uh, we have two, two dimensions when we're talking about Cosmos DB and how we, how we pay for it effectively. Uh, to be a little crude in terms of talking about cloud. Uh, and so those two components that we're talking about are uh, th throughput and storage. So we pay for RUs per second for uh, and the number of RUs we have is one element, but we also pay for storage on a per terabyte level. Um, we've already discussed throughput, uh, but excuse me, per gigabyte. Uh, Cosmos okay. DB is going to consume that SSD storage in per gigabyte per month uh, charges. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Now, Azure Cosmos DB actually does provide something known as the capacity calculator which is a fantastic product which you can leverage. It's obviously like an offline form that you fill in and you plug in the details about your existing data workload if you already have one and it helps you actually estimate your application storage and throughput requirements. And this obviously would translate into an estimated cost in terms of, um, in terms of Cosmos DB. Um, here on the slide uh, or on the stream rather, uh, you should be able to see a screen snippet of that. Actually, let me uh, zoom in a bit because I can only appreciate that this is probably super tiny right now. But the information that you would provide here is obviously the API that you're utilizing, the number of regions that you want to have uh, your, your data written across, whether you are using multi-region writes or not. Uh, another brilliant feature, if you ask me. Um, then per region, you're going to specify what is the total data stored in transactional stores in gigabits, uh, in gigabytes again, whether you use an analytical store, what uh, is one single item size. So, so there's actually a bunch of things that you got to tweak. And once you have done so, what you end up with is an actual estimated cost. And it's, it's going to tell you, hey, your actual storage account 
um, sorry, your actual, your actual Cosmos DB account will have um, this cost at the end of the month. And well, you did a good estimate with that. 35,000 RUs and what was that? A terabyte of storage or? Yeah, I think this is a fictional example here. <laughs> 1, 1. 1. 1.5 terabytes. 1.5. Yeah. 5. yeah so, and, and obviously the, the, the compute element of that, just like most things in the cloud is more, is more costly than the storage element. So if you're off on your initial calculation of the storage, I think it's less important. Uh, but it is something to kind of keep in mind. Uh, with that, Cosmos DB also kind of offers a self-pruning uh, mechanism. And typically, you're going to want to use this function within, uh, uh, in conjunction with archiving data out of Cosmos DB, or you're just throwing away your data uh, if your data is short term and, and maybe not something you need to retain forever. But this gives Cosmos DB the ability, uh, by the way, you may notice this term also if you've done work with DNS, uh, time to live. Uh, <laughs> but this is specific to Cosmos DB and storage. It provides Cosmos DB the ability to automatically delete items from a container after a certain time period. So by default, you can set time to live at the container level, and you can even override that on a per item basis. But after you set that at the container or item level, uh, Cosmos DB is going to automatically delete those items after the time period uh, since the time they were last modified. And so this value is configured in seconds. Uh, and when you can configure time to live, the system will automatically delete expired items based on that value. I got to tell you a fun story about this one, Joey, actually. <laughs> I can see how ago. this could go bad. So let me let me hear it. Two years ago, I was part of a proof of concept, and we implemented Cosmos DB. We had a demo day. Everything was fantastic. It was running smooth, right? We filled up the Cosmos DB account with a bunch of data. We were explaining how data migration works, and we plugged it in with Data Factory, and we were moving data around. Everything was sweet, like super, super sweet. And there we go. So we prepared for this one, I think, for like almost a week. On the sixth day, we did all the tasks we needed. So that on the seventh day, after we kicked off the proof of concept, we were presenting it to a potential customer. And here we go. <laughs> we open up our, our laptops, we start the application, and boom, there's no data inside. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think the reason for that was? Time to live was set to, oh, I don't know, 10 days. There you go. Actually, it, it was. So we obviously, the time to live was the actual reason for why the data was purged automatically. But we blamed a demo or a tutorial, rather, that we have copied over, like, you know, building blogs these days and stuff. So that mm -hmm. just copies from Stack Overflow some stuff. It works. <laughs> it's, it's already done. You don't need to work on it anymore. Well, uh, but it, sure enough, we're actually inserting data back in those days. Uh, and, and it's one of those things where, where you're, you, you enable the setting. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't really do anything. It's just like, OK. And then three days later, you don't have data. Poof. <laughs> yeah, so use the setting carefully. Uh, I guess a better question for you, Alex, would be, can you describe some customer scenarios where you've used this? Oh, yeah. So actually, one of, one of the applications that we're developing is an event management system. And on the event management system, there's a lot of telemetry, there's a lot of logs, there's a lot of um, shopping carts that people are setting up. And sometimes people, people are not checking out, for example, their shopping basket, their shopping carts, right? Uh, so there's a policy that is configured for every single event that we are setting up. And therefore, for every single shopping basket for each customer, which ends up being a single document, uh, we want those tickets, which are otherwise reserved because they're reserving a seat, to be actually pulled away and uh, not be made available anymore. Uh, and per event, there, the, the event organizer is setting usually that there is a time to leave of your tickets when the seats that you have reserved for like either uh, 24 hours or maybe a couple of days or a week or whatnot, depending on how far away the actual event actually how happens to be. So time to live was a fantastic opportunity for us because we didn't have to use background services and or act actors and um, Orleans based implementations to determine like a timer. And now we're going to start counting how many seconds are going to pass ever since you click that button to add to basket. And we're going to remove that product from your basket and stuff like that. It just happens automatically within Cosmos DB. And that's so beautiful. And there's also no RU consumption with it actually either. Yeah, it only it only works in the background. So uh, if if everything's overloaded, uh, the data deletion will be delayed. Yeah, I I love that maximum TTL value, 
which is what two billion years. 147 million it's 70 years years. right yeah absolutely 70 years that's right <laughs> we should have just put 70 years on the slide <laughs> yeah that might that, that might have been a little bit easier in case you were wondering yeah that's in seconds yeah so configuring this on a container uh, if you do not have it configured uh items are not automatically expired so that is uh that is another approach. If you use negative one for your default time to live, items will, will not never expire by default. And if you set uh, items to a specific number of seconds, uh, they will expire after that number of seconds. And we'll show this kind of an illustration on the next slide. Mm -hmm. So here we see uh, the default time to live on where we set it on the container. So remember, we can set it on the container and an individual item. Uh, typically, I would prefer to set this on the container level, but uh, it's going to depend always on the nature of your data and application. Uh, we don't have, uh, we have a null value for the item time to live. Uh, it's going to expire in a thousand seconds. If we have the same container time to live, but we specify on the item that it's, it's time to live is negative one, it will never expire. And likewise, uh, if we have a 2000 val greater than uh, item time to live, it's going to default to the item time to live. So I think another way to put it is that the item time to live, if set, takes precedence, right? Or is, is, is higher priority, it's more granular, and therefore is uh, going to be overriding whatever the container time to live was set, right? Yep, exactly. Cool. Here's another follow-up example to that one. But yeah, I think yeah. uh, everything is clear by now. Yeah, so th I think the only thing, yeah, the only thing that's kind of interesting here is the the null negative one in the middle. But uh, mm, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Con conceptually, these are all kind of the same. That's right. Which actually take us now to planning for data retention with time to live, which is an interesting scenario, uh, an interesting topic around a few scenarios, right? Azure Cosmos DB only builds for storage that you directly consume in real time. And you don't have to like pre-reserve storage in advance, as was the case with pre-provisioned throughput. Mm -hmm. So in high write scenarios, TTL values can actually be used to like save data on storage costs in Azure Cosmos DB. And data that has already been shipped out of the data warehouse or aggregated and uh, stored in other forms or elsewhere can be immediately purged actually to ensure that you only keep a fresh and relevant data in the local SSD storage. Uh, there are several solutions and scenarios for this one. Want to touch on that one maybe, Joey? Yeah, and, and it's going to depend on the nature of what you're doing with, with your data. Uh, effectively, all of these, in my opinion, kind of generically fall down into an ETL process. But change feed is going to be kind of a, a, a live stream where as data changes, you ship it out of Cosmos DB, maybe through an event hub uh, into some other target source. Uh, you can ship this into. I think this slide's slightly out of date. I believe the, the appropriate term is Azure Synapse Analytics uh, right. provision SQL resource, uh, formerly known as Azure SQL Data Warehouse. Uh, or you could ship it in Azure Bob Storage or Azure Data Lake Storage. Uh, effectively, you're just trying to lower your cost of, well, in the case of Bob Storage or Data Lake, you're lowering your cost of data storage where you might do analytics on the data later. Uh, where you would use uh, Azure Data Warehouse, would be, or Synapse Analytics, excuse me, would be if you wanted to rather quickly probably report on that data uh, using ad, ad hoc SQL queries or even pre can SQL queries. And change feed would kind of be if you wanted to alert on data values that were changing uh, based on data as it was changing in your Cosmos DB. Absolutely. I guess it's a good time to do a knowledge check. Yeah, it sounds like it. we're perfect and on time. I do want to remind everyone that a poll that, well, depending obviously on the stream platform that you're streaming in with, a poll should come up and you will be able to vote on what you think the right answer is. So let's take the first question. What rate-based rate concurrency acronym is used as a simplification of CPU, memory, and IOPS? And the options are A, R use per second, B, TTL, or C, vCPUs, which I just find to be a bit <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> So let's take it maybe bottom up, vCPUs. What do you think about this one, Joey? Uh, Simplification of CPU and memory and IOPS. <laughs> yeah, no, it doesn't doesn't really seem like it. Uh, it except in Azure SQL database, it kind of is. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it could be right. Mm. 
What about B? TTL. Time I don't think it's TTL. I think we we pretty recently established uh, that was not that was not what that is. Yeah, we definitely sure have done that. Um, so obviously, without a sh single shadow of doubt, the right answer here one would be yeah. R use per second. Yoo hoo! We've nailed that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. Which property of a container should be specified to automatically purge items after the specified number of seconds? Expiration, so, default time to live, or underscore TTL? So I, I want to protest this question. Uh, <laughs> actually, I'm not sure if this is the case. I, I'd have to look it up. This is just, I'm going to give you a Microsoft gu learning guideline. Mm -hmm. There are never uh, completely wrong answers on a Microsoft exam. Everything, everything that's on the exam exists, I should say. So, like, I don't think expiration <coughs> is, a, is a property. So, the hence why I'm saying it can't be a right answer and I'm protesting. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't have to be applicable. So, like, you could be asking a SQL question and I could insert a PowerShell commandlet. But it's a, it is a valid PowerShell commandlet. So, just know that uh, there's never a, a completely unplausible answer on a Microsoft exam. But going back to our question on our <laughs> topic today, <laughs> I would probably specify default time to live. Yes, that would be my answer. Brilliant. Great one. Um, OK, cool. So in this first part, which actually is, well, more than halfway by now, yeah, <clears throat> we actually covered quite a lot on understanding, evaluating, and planning for your um, workload throughput and your storage needs. And the next part for today, and obviously, if you want to learn more, make sure that you are actually following the uh, various modules available on Microsoft Learn. And the second part for today will be on configuring Azure Cosmos DB SQL API database and containers. Um, so we're now kicking off to another module, part of the same learning path. And part of this, we are actually going to cover uh, a lot of the application requirements. Because you know, applications, they come in many different patterns, and they have different predict predictable usage scenarios, so they could be spiked with sudden traffic surges. And Azure Cosmos DB has multiple ways to like host workloads that map directly to how applications run in the real world. And whether the applications are predictable or entirely growth-based is really up to you, really. So once we will talk about this, you'll be able to understand the various uh, service and throughput offerings that Azure Cosmos DB has, and also be able to migrate between standard and auto-scale throughput, or determine whether serverless is a thing that would be useful for your scenario. And we're actually going to start with serverless. Alex, is serverless Cosmos DB really serverless? I think there are always going to be servers involved. And they, <laughs> it's a fun thing, because a couple of years ago, Jeff Holland, uh, Mr. Serverless guy, as some people mm -hmm. might know him, uh, posted the picture of a empty rack in front of him, <laughs> stating or quoting, this is the serverless data center at Microsoft. <laughs> I, 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 like, I understand serverless a lot, uh, because I use Azure Logic Apps for a lot of things. They're, to me, they're like the glue that holds Azure together. Uh, and, and I've even written Azure Functions and done like automation too as a service that I really consider to be serverless. Uh, it's just funny when we talk about Cosmos DB serverless or Azure SQL database serverless, but you still have a server name or an account name. Uh, you sure have. You sure have. It's 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 a marketing uh, made up term, obviously. Uh, I, I still like when I present something related to serverless in PowerPoint and the red squiggles appear because it's not even a word in English, but that's a different conversation, I guess. Anyways, what serverless is in, in Cosmos DB terms is a consumption-based model where each request consumes request units, right? So the consumption model eliminates the need to pre-provision the throughput on the container or the database level. You must remember, however, that when you are using Azure Cosmos DB, you typically express the database options as a cost which is described in request units per second. So in some scenarios, might actually expect that your Cosmos DB database to like sit idle most of the time, only processing um, requests occasionally. And this is typically the case when you get started with Cosmos DB, when you're building a prototype, or even run a small non-critical application, or maybe you're just a very small shop, like the florist shop I was telling you about earlier. So if you, if you have that, provisioning throughput isn't really required. Instead, you just need some sort of a cost-effective way 
to pay for the individual database uh, request you are sending. And to best serve this kind of use case, Microsoft is extremely excited actually to offer this serverless offering, which is purely consumption based, meaning that you only pay for the actual request units that you are literally consuming by your database operations and only for the storage consumed by your data. And that's it. So it's really a, 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 a paper request building model and nothing more. Nothing is going to ever get pre-provisioned in that. Alex, I have a question for you. Uh, in Azure SQL Database Serverless, uh, my per second uh, cost is actually higher than if I'm using a provision model. Uh, is that the case in Cosmos DB or my request units in serverless priced differently than my request units in uh, provision? I honestly don't know the answer to that one. I'm, I'm, I'm the kind of person, even in my family, who just pays the bills and I have no idea where the money goes. <laughs> let's see. Let's see. I'll, I'll see if I can dig around and find that answer while we're talking. <laughs> I, I actually look it up myself, but uh, if you want, we can take this, all, this one offline. Now, serverless is actually great for a lot of applications with unpredictable or bursty traffic. And you can definitely use serverless with an application such as a new application with um, hard to forecast user loads or an application which sits idle, as I've said previously, most of the time, or maybe a new prototype, which obviously is going to sit idle because you're only going to develop probably around eight hours per day or whatnot. Um, <clears throat> or maybe you're just getting started with Azure Cosmos DB as a new developer. So going back to your question, Joey, is since serverless is designed for like not necessarily spiky applications, but applications which sit idle and don't really have a lot of consumption, utilizing serverless in that sense for something that is constantly running doesn't necessarily make sense, right? Yeah, and so I, do, I, do have, I, I do have our answer. Uh, the price for 1 million RUs is roughly... Uh, it's it's hard to compare. I need to do more math. So the price for 100 RUs per second and provisioned is is 0 0.008 cents per hour. Uh, and serverless is 28 cents per million RUs. So uh, it's going to be three times the price, right? Roughly, yeah. Cool. But then again, you should probably not use the the other approach when yeah, you, you also have some limits actually. By the way, if you if I come yeah. To think of it. Typically, when you're using a server, you're going to use serverless when, like you mentioned, something's idle most of the time because it's typically going to be far more cost effective. It is something you kind of want to monitor for, though. Uh, and you can either monitor on your resource consumption or you can even just monitor this through Azure budgeting. Uh, if you see your costs start to spike suddenly, then it may be time to evaluate switching to a provision model. But again, serverless would be fantastic if you're just getting started, right? Yeah, so for sure. And, and once you know how your data schemes look like and whatnot, you would just go ahead and uh, go with pre-provision. Or, or you could go with the auto scale that we're going to talk in a second. But now let's actually compare and contrast maybe serverless with uh, the pre-provisioned or the provision throughput configurations. First question would be, how do you choose between serverless and provision throughput? I guess there are a bunch of criteria that you should look into. And the first one would be comparing the workloads, right? <clears throat> Sorry about that. So prov provision throughput is ideal for a number of different workloads with predict predictable traffic patterns that require like sustained or predictable performance with minimal variance. But on the other hand, serverless can handle workloads that have widely varying traffic and low average to peak traffic, may uh, uh, traffic ratios maybe. There are other criteria in which serverless and provision throughput should be considered. For example, comparing the RUs. Might want to take this one, Joey, maybe for a second? Uh, comparing the, yeah, you, you, go ahead, because I, I blanked out for a second. <laughs> Sorry about that. No worries. Yeah, so no the whole idea when you're comparing the request units is that your provision throughputs um, actually make some number of request units available each second um, mm -hmm. and to each container for database operations. And the number of request units can actually be updated either manually or using this auto scale feature that we keep on promoting, but we haven't touched yet on. Mm -hmm. Just bear with us. Uh, and then serverless actually doesn't require any planning or any kind of automatic provisioning for that matter. And you can deliver the throughput up to a documented service limit because there is mm -hmm. a limit with, serverl uh, with serverless, which otherwise you wouldn't have had with your pre-provisioned throughput. And another factor that you, you should compare serverless with pre provisioned throughput by is the global distribution. Serverless mm -hmm. accounts can only run in a single Azure region, whereas your pre provisioned throughput support actually distributing your data to an unlimited number of Azure regions. As you know, the number of Azure regions grows almost every other month. 
Um, I don't even know what the number of Azure regions right now is. I know it's just 70 plus, and I'm going to stick with that because it might be 72, 74, 76. It always changes. It's one of my most difficult slides in all my slide decks. I, I take a screenshot it. of it the morning I'm presenting every time. <laughs> every time, every single time. Yeah. And then last but not least, you should also compare the serverless versus the provision throughput um, uh, approaches by looking at the storage limits. I told you there are some limits with serverless, and this is one of them. Your serverless offerings only allow up to 50 gigabytes of data in a single container, whereas your provision throughput allows you to store unlimited data pretty much in a container. Uh, we have a question from Arthur about a uh, minimum amount you need to pay per day or month, or can you really set up some workload uh, and pay pennies if you just use tiny objects? You can just pay pennies. Azure is absolutely happy to bill you in pennies. <laughs> there is a minimum amount. There is a minimum amount they they will charge you for that. I think is like a dollar, if I remember correctly. <clears throat> is it a dollar or is it really a cent? I don't know. But I know that for my yeah. invoices, which are like zero zero zero, they don't even like zero dollars and zero cents. They don't even issue an invoice, even though there's yeah. like a number, but they don't even send it because I, I I guess sending an email becomes more expensive. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So we have talked a lot about this terminology auto scale, and I know some of my customers, at least, have had some confusion between serverless and auto scale, right? Uh, and they're definitely different. So whereas serverless is a great fit when you have idle working work workloads, auto scale is somewhat different. So auto scale in that sense is actually uh, a fantastic uh, a fantastic approach when you want to meet your actual workload requirements. And we can often make an educated guess about where our workload will be as far as throughput, but we don't exactly know where it lands until it's in production, when the application is, as I like to say, out in the wild. And we also may know that um, our application may have some operational tolerances, right? So we know the maximum amount of money we are willing to pay or to spend, rather, to invest would be a better word, I guess. Uh, and also the minimum amount of performance that we're ready to tolerate. So by taking these two metrics into account, and with all the information in mind, we could actually define like a range, a range which again is the minimal performance you tolerate and the maximum amount of money you're, you're ready to pay. And this range represents our application running at a comf comfortable performance level without over, ever overspending with, uh, without your knowledge. So Azure Cosmos DB Auto Scale, which previously, by the way, used to be called Autopilot, but then they just changed it for some reason, um, it helps you define a range of request units per second to scale the database or the container automatically and, well, pretty much instant, instantly. So the throughput our use is effectively scaled on real-time usages um, instantly. Autoscale is therefore great for a lot of different workloads which have variable, unpredictable per performance patterns and also helps you minimize the unused capacity that the traffic would typically be provisioned with. And yeah, the this slide, I think, shows a good example. One of the things we haven't really talked about uh, yet is the nature of your application and who it's serving, right? So in this scenario, this could be, because we're not totally maxing out for a long period of time, this could be a good example of, say, a customer-facing application, maybe that's painting web pages or serving data in, an applica in, a, in a web app where you're going to want pretty good response time from your users. Uh, where you might have a tighter range of min and min perf and max spend might be something that's doing batch processing. Like, for example, if you're processing a, a payroll system uh, and you just you have a batch workload that has to complete in 12 hours, not really a typical use case for Cosmos, but just hear me out. Uh, any kind of batch processing or background processing that's not directly customer facing, you can kind of use a narrower, narrower perf window and lower your cost potentially because you're happy to run at full capacity as long as the operation you're doing finishes within some time frame that you've defined. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Um, auto scale, therefore, is definitely not the same thing as serverless. Auto scale is, again, that range in which you're happy to pay and also uh, you're tolerating some minimal performance. Because what Autoscale really does, it minimizes the actual RUs that you're paying for up to the point where your actual request increases or demand increases for your workload. And then the provision throughput for your, for your containers or for your database is going to increase based on your actual demand. And it's going to decrease when your demand decreases as well. Right? That's pretty much what you're doing here. <clears throat> 
Okay, cool. So if you are about to migrate between your standard and your auto scale throughput, there are some, some things to take into consideration. The first one is that any con existing containers can actually be migrated to and from auto scale directly through the Azure portal, or maybe using the Azure CLI or Azure PowerShell command bits, or even if you're doing things programmatically by using the .NET or any other uh, libraries which are available, um, which are actually just wrapping the under underlying REST APIs. Now, during the migration process, the system automatically applies a request unit per second value to the container. And once that is done, obviously you can always change the R use value after the migration has occurred. Once that is done, you can actually, well, go to town and have uh, and leverage auto scale. Or if you don't fancy auto scale and want to go back to the pre provisioned throughput for uh, your workload, because maybe you don't have a spiky utilization, maybe I think is super constant, then auto scale doesn't really make a lot of sense to you. Uh, you can always go back. And that also works. Now, in the Microsoft Learn module, in case you are planning actually to, to go at your own pace after this, uh, after this session, and I encourage you to do that, in the Microsoft Learn module, there is an exercise, a fantastic exercise that has you go through configuring the throughput for an Azure Cosmos DB SQL API from the Azure portal. Now, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip that. But I want to show you a couple of things which are pretty interesting, nevertheless. Um, let me actually do a bit of Windows magic here. And hopefully, my screen sharing didn't freeze. Uh, one can only hope, right? <laughs> Uh, there we go. So here I have the seventh unit of this module already opened up. And in within this module, your exercise is actually at the, at the seventh unit. You have this option of starting the lab. And this is, a, again, a fantastic piece of tech available uh, on Microsoft Learn, which allows you, oh, what just happened here? Let me do this one more time, because apparently something just froze. No blue screen, no blue screen, no blue screen. <laughs> No blue screen, but but no revert. My my, my monitors are just like messing around right now, and I have no idea what you guys are seeing. So that's not fun. Let me duplicate this one more time, and hopefully you're gonna see the right screens. You know what happened? I think there was a pop-up notification which asked me what I want to keep my setting for revert, which had like a timeout of 15 seconds, and I guess I just turned off, and it reverted. Um, hopefully you can you can still see my my my. Uh, Microsoft Learn module. Yeah, I, see your, I see your mouse now, so it's back. Appreciate over. it. Really. Yeah. So here we have the Start Lab button. And again, as I was saying, this is one of those things in Microsoft Learn where you don't have to have an Azure subscription. You don't have to have uh, or spend your own money. They actually invest their own funds to help you learn these technologies. So you know what? I should, probably should have sacrificed the production virtual machine in favor of the demo gods prior to actually opening up this button here. Let's try it one more time. Am I still logged in? I'm logged in. Let's click the launch lab button. And this should actually open up a different window in my favorite browser. And let's click the start lab but, uh, button one more time. There we go. This is actually running on something called Learn On Demand. They have actually rebranded just a over a month ago to Skillable. It's a Microsoft partner, and they are providing a in-browser experience with kind of a remote desktop experience where they're going to give you access to a virtual machine and you're going to have all of the instructions on the right side of the screen. And as you go through the instructions and as you follow the instructions, you're effectively going to configure uh, and move away, migrate away from a pre-provisioned throughput over to auto scale and then go the other way around. The overall exercise takes roughly 10 to 15 minutes, but they are going to give you this entire environment for a full hour. So if you want to mess around, if you want to learn more stuff, you can, well, pretty much go nuts with it. But after the hour, the virtual machine will be um, deallocated from you, and you'll go back to your Microsoft Learn module, and you'll follow along um, the rest of the uh, instructions and their exercises. OK, cool. So there's that with the exercise. Again, I'm, I'm, I'll leave the pleasure to our audience to actually go through the exercise, mostly in the interest of time right now. And um, we're probably surely, uh, slowly but surely, heading towards the end of our uh, class today, aren't we? Yeah, I think so. OK. Um, some things are happening here with my screen. Let's see, where is my? There we go. Cool. Hopefully, everything is back on track. So that was yeah. the exercise. And now we have, towards the end, a quick knowledge check, uh, which I'm probably going to blaze through. First question for you, Joey. 
from the knowledge check. Your Cosmos DB container has manually provisioned throughput. Incoming requests have exceeded the provisioned request units per second. What <laughs> happens next? Our, and our answer is here, uh, Azure Cosmos DB will rate limit subsequent requests. Azure Cosmos DB will scale RUs up to a service maximum of 50,000 uh, RUs per second. Or Cosmos DBs will scale uh, RUs up to a maximum uh, RUs per second that you have previously configured. I'm going to go with A because we haven't defined anything. We haven't defined anything. And even if we would have defined historically in the past a different value, uh, well, Microsoft is never going to put you there. <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's, no, there's no free compute in the cloud. You get what you pay for. That's right. I couldn't have said it any, any way better. Every, yes, everything I, is quality of service. <laughs> absolutely. You're, abs you're absolutely right on that one. Your Azure Cosmos DB will actually rate limit any subsequent requests up until the point where you still have any available RUs as you, they were configured, um, either pre-provisioned or by the maximum of the auto scale. Now, the second question is a bit of a mouthful. It's actually a large, a long one. While building a proof of concept, your web development team was able to successfully estimate the throughput needs of your application within a 5% margin of error and does not expect any significant variances over time. When running in production, the team expects your workload to be extraordinarily stable. What type of throughput option should you consider? Autoscale, serverless, or standard? I would lean towards in this scenario. Uh, well, first of all, I wouldn't believe my development team. Uh, <laughs> but second, secondly, if they were accurate, uh, I would lean towards standard. But I would, I would probably have auto scale configured with about a ten percent rate of uh, of growth, just to cover any any off and them being off by a bit, at least for the first couple of months. Yeah, I think this always is one of the typical answers. It depends, right? Because you could go with auto serverless would not be a good option here because you are yeah. always going to you run your application. So we can we can scratch that one. But if there is some variation, there is an there might be an interesting opportunity to use auto scale depending on how much of a variation you actually have, and also obviously depending on what your minimal RU consumption would be. Because remember, when you configure auto scale. The minimal RU consumption is going to be 10% of what your maximum is. So if your variation ends up being, say, uh, up to 10,000 requests per uh, per second, your minimal must be 1,000 RUs per second. But if you commonly use um, 400 RUs per second by going with auto scale, you're already making your workload more expensive than it should be, right? For just just to give an example. So mm -hmm. considering that your variation here is within a 5% margin. You might actually configure some, assuming what obviously you know your RU needs, are use needs. You might actually configure even a standard uh, pre-provisioned throughput option, just on the assumption that you may configure something slightly larger, because five percent isn't that much. But again, five percent out of what uh, is yeah. what you should consider. So it pretty much it depends. Um, if you are to answer this one on the knowledge check or Microsoft Learn, uh, the right answer would be standard for this one. <laughs> An exam, a real exam question would be clearer than that. <laughs> That's one For of the sure. things when we write exams, we have to, there's always, and just a couple of quick tips, we always try to drive towards a very correct answer. So there, it's going to be very rare, the situation, if you have an understanding of the material where you're like, it could be A, but it could be B. You know, it's the, the stem of the question is going to drive you either towards A or B specifically. Or it could be A or it could be B, unless you actually know your stuff. <laughs> well, if you know it. So, for example, if we wanted this question to be auto scale, we would say a 75% margin of error, just to make it very clear that your developers have no idea of what the, what the workload is going to look like. Cool. And with that, um, we have actually covered our learning objectives today so far, which was number one, evaluating the various requirements of the application. Um, comparing the various service and throughput offerings for Cosmos DB, and then also migrating the standard and auto scale throughput. Now, we still have a bit of time, right? So let's maybe do a bit of an exercise here. We did say previously that we have a bunch of different APIs. Again, SQL API, MongoDB API, they're both document DBs and in no SQL terms. I typically use them interchangeably almost. Uh, you have your table API, you have your Cassandra API, you have your Gremlin APIs. When would you use each one of these one, Joey? 
Huh. So I'm I'm just going to take graph uh, for example uh, because I it, it's something I present on a lot. I have a lot of expertise. Uh, gra document databases and relational databases are really poor at showing hierarchies. Uh, so things like org charts, uh, bills of account, how accounts are connected. Uh, if you think about LinkedIn, uh, LinkedIn's like probably one of the most common representations of a graph database where you have friend of a friend kind of models. Uh, so if you're trying to represent those kind of re relationship data, like, and this could even be vendors to customers or sales reps to customers, uh, that's when, when, when that's the question you're trying to answer from your data, that's when you're going to want to use a, a gremlin model. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Uh, I have a similar scenario, actually, with our event management platform. We use three different Cosmos DB accounts, believe it or not. Um, and the reason for that is quite simple. We use different APIs. So <laughs> one of the APIs um, is a Gremlin-based APIs, and we use it for a recommendation engine. So effectively, when somebody buys a ticket for an event, like, um, say, say a, a music concert, and um, you see that they recurrently buy other tickets at other music con uh, um, con at other con concerts, we actually create a well, obviously everyone does that. We can create a small profile and we look at the vertices. Effectively, the similarities with other buyers mm -hmm. who have bought tickets at the same con concerts. They might be fans, they might be groupies, you don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. And if we see that somebody buys a ticket and this individual hasn't, but they do share a lot of similarities between them, our Gremlin API makes it super simple to query the information relevant to this user and tell them, hey, we recommend that you also buy a ticket or maybe just look over this event as well. Or maybe we do, sometimes we do the same thing, not necessarily on your uh, buying habits, but sometimes we actually look at other things, such as um, the location, where you are super location aware, oh, our application is location aware. And therefore, if you constantly buy tickets in the same places, you might be actually living somewhere close to that location, or you might be traveling quite often over there. So you might be interested in other uh, tickets over there at, at that particular location. And again, looking at things where there are similarities between different entities, um, makes it super simple for us to do recommendations. And therefore, Gremlin API lends itself quite nicely for recommendation engines. The different, uh, the second different API that we use for Cosmos DB, and before somebody asks, once you pick an API, you kind of are stick with it mm -hmm. uh, on Cosmos DB terms. If you want to change the API, you got to, well, pre-provision another Cosmos DB uh, account for that matter. Uh, the second one is MongoDB. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, the third one that we use is SQL API. And they're both document um, APIs. They're document NoSQL uh, database stores. So one might ask, why do you use, why do you guys use both MongoDB and SQL API? And I don't know what your answer would be, Joey, but at least in our scenario, it was there was one service which was using MongoDB back in the day, and we just want to make it super simple to run this on Azure and also use that service for our event management system. My so, guess was going to be that you bought a company that had an app that ran on MongoDB, but yeah, almost, almost. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the idea with Cosmos DB, even though it's a product proprietary for Microsoft, by the fact that they're uh, surfacing the MongoDB API, simply by changing the connection string, you are now running a MongoDB-based database on Cosmos DB and take advantage of all the bells and whistles effectively uh, that Cosmos DB has to offer in terms of uh, multi-writes, multi-masters, uh, geo-distribution, single-digit millisecond latency, which I just love from Cosmos DB. And for everything that we have built in-house, because, well, we're a very Microsoft-centric shop, we have actually leveraged SQL API instead with the, mm -hmm. what we have called back in the day document, document DB rather than Cosmos DB. And there's a couple more, right? Table API and Cassandra yeah. API. Want to cover those maybe? And table table API, and, and I think this is probably less commonly used, but the table API was, uh, if anybody's familiar with Azure Table Storage, which was... Azure Table Storage is a, a very cheap uh, key value store that's available in Azure. Initially, like in the old days, Azure used it a lot itself for logging. I think it does far less now. I think it mainly throws everything into log analytics. Uh, but a lot of applications were developed to take advantage of that API. Uh, what Cosmos DB delivers to you over Azure Table is performance. Uh, and so... Cosmos DB has high, higher maximum performance than Azure, the Azure Table Storage mechanism. Uh, so you can, much like uh, Alex was talking about, where you move an application that was running on Mongo to Cosmos for all the other benefits of Cosmos, you can do the same thing with Table Storage. Uh, 
we talked a little bit about Cassandra earlier with with Columnar. Uh, any place you'd use Cassandra and you don't want to manage your Cassandra anymore, or you, you want to move to a managed service and you want to move that application without having to reauthor the application, uh, you can simply use Cosmos in that in that function. Yeah, so effectively, if you already have an application um, which was written for Apache Cassandra, you don't have to rewrite your application from scratch just because now you're leveraging a Microsoft proprietary technology, right? So uh, you are taking the existing Apache drivers, which are compliant with uh, uh, CQL v4, and your existing Cassandra application would now be able to communicate with Azure Cosmos DB, obviously, thanks to the Cassandra API. And many, in many cases, you can switch from using Apache Cassandra to using Azure Cosmos DB, again, just by doing a connection string. So this would be very similar to the scenario where you um, are moving from a MongoDB to another MongoDB running on top of Cosmos DB um, accounts instead. Yeah. Cool. Cool. So with that being said, I don't know about you, Joey, but I've definitely had a lot of fun today. Yeah, um, for sure. Are we ready to maybe wrap it up? I think so. Awesome. So if people want to learn more about Cosmos DB, definitely make sure that you head over to the Microsoft Learn module. There's one on creating a Cosmos uh, container and database with Autoscale. There's one on uh, which is called Introduction to Provisioning Throughput in uh, Azure Cosmos DB, Azure Cosmos DB Serverless. Uh, there's one on how to choose between standard, manual, and autoscale provisioned throughput, which we have, we, have, we have covered today as well. And also how to choose between provisioned throughput and serverless. Again, and don't we have forget. Covered... Go ahead. Okay, and don't forget to take a look at the Cosmos DB exam, the Azure Cosmos DB developer specialty. Uh, it is the exam number is DP four twenty, uh, so you can look at that if you want to take your skills even further after you look at the learn module. Oh yeah, absolutely. Actually, Joey, you wrote you wrote some part of the certification, haven't you? Yeah, I touch a lot of these certification exams, so they all kind of run together. But yeah. So this is not to say that people should reach out to you after the live session. With, I can't. Uh, I cannot answer any questions. So uh, <laughs> look at look at the uh, look at the exam outline. On I, people always ask me how to study for exams, and uh, I honestly tell them if you read the because Microsoft publishes like an outline for each exam. Uh, read the outline. Study what's on the outline. If you feel comfortable with your knowledge of what's in that outline, go take the exam. It's the best way to to study for it or is to, to take the exam. And if you pass it, woohoo. If not, just take it again. Uh, I ad admittedly, I, I failed my uh, first attempt at the Azure security exam last September because I kind of got, fr I first of all made the mistake of taking it at uh, late one Monday afternoon. Uh, and so it was kind of in a hurry and I blew through some questions and I missed passing by like one question. Uh, but I went back a week later and was able to pass it. So. Yeah. You know, Joey, I've always said taking an exam is part of a learning opportunity and learning curve, right? So even though you know you might not pass it at first, no worries, you have still learned something about Definitely. the way the, the questions are structured and so on and so forth. And on that, this is actually a fantastic segue to my last um, point I want to stress out, which is it doesn't stop here. Your learning opportunity doesn't stop here. You don't want to miss our next episode because remember, this is a series of eight different episodes. So you don't want to miss the next one, which is going to be on moving data into and out of Azure Cosmos DB SQL API. I'm very excited for that one. Yeah, it should be very interesting. Uh... It, it sure will. OK, cool. So that happens on January 26th. And uh, with that being said, again, Joey, it was such a pleasure to have you here with me today. It, it was great and working with you, Alex. Absolutely. Everyone, enjoy your time and make sure to keep on grinding on Microsoft Learn and just keep studying. <laughs>